Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Breakfast by the Bay. My name is Adam Kowarski. I'm Save the Bay's Aquarian Biologist. And today, we're going to learn about some new things. Um, so we're going to take a look at various animals in Narragansett Bay that have adapted over eons to have interesting natural defenses. So to put this in perspective, all animals have some way to defend themselves, right? Whether it's camouflage, sharp teeth, claws, good hiding places, things like that. Uh, but then some animals develop really unique, interesting adaptations to do this. And today, we're going to look at a few of the animals within Save the Bay's Aquarium, that's where we are right now, uh, that have some really interesting natural defenses that they have adapted. All right, so for anyone who is joining us now, again, my name is Adam Kowarski. We're at Save the Bay's Aquarium, learning about some of the natural defenses that animals have here uh, on this morning's Breakfast by the Bay. Um, so, the first type of animal I want to talk about uh, is the boxfish family, animals in the boxfish family. Um, so anything that's in the boxfish family, also known as Ostracidae, uh, these animals are really unique. They have a very boxy shaped body uh, with a bunch of hexagons all over it. They swim really weirdly, uh, but they have this really unique adaptation where they actually secrete a poisonous substance called ostracitoxin from epidermal glands. So that's glands all over their skin, all right? Now the first one that I want to take a look at, this is one of my most favorite animals. They're right over here. So why don't we take a nice close look at these guys. So these guys here are called the smooth trunk fish, and look at that, they're just like puppies. They're coming right up to us. They are just one of the coolest animals ever. Now in the boxfish family, these are actually the most toxic of any, all right? So these guys release that toxin from their skin. It only happens when they're stressed out, so sick, dying, or maybe being attacked by a predator. And when they release this toxin, it's a really good defense. Some animals might get sick or even pass away from how strong this toxin is. Uh, and these are the most toxic of any of them on the planet. All right, now uh, I think it's breakfast for you guys maybe, uh, but definitely breakfast for these guys. Uh, and we're gonna feed these guys. So they're getting some shrimp today. Uh, we're gonna see if anyone's hungry. So I'm gonna squirt it right in here. And let's just take a minute to watch. One thing that I've noticed, oh wow, look at that, they're going for it. So they have this tiny, very sharp beak that they use to crunch the shells of different animals, but they can also use it to suck up their food. They can squirt jets of water to find their food as well. And you can see these guys, they're not very fast swimmers at all. So you can imagine they would need other defenses for survival. Excreting that toxin is just one reason why these guys have been around on our planet for so long, doing so well. Gosh, they're beautiful. All right, so I have a ton of stuff I'd like to show you guys today. So if you're ready, let's go check out another member of the boxfish family. All right, guys, come on, right this way, let's go. All right, so we're heading on over here past our seahorses, our salt marsh. We did those on some of our last breakfast by the days. And we're over here to our longhorn cowfish. This is another member of the boxfish family. The way that this one's identified compared to the smooth trunk fish is that it actually has two horns on its head, makes it look kind of like a cow, all right? Uh, oh, and I see a question here from Janine. What are they eating? They're eating a mixture of shrimp. They get brine shrimp and mysis shrimp. If you want, we can, we've shown it before, but let's take a look for anyone who maybe hasn't seen. Let's take a look at my little feeding container. So you can see we have all these really teeny tiny shrimp in here, all right? And in a second, we're gonna feed this guy a little bit more as well. So you can see the longhorn cowfish has a very yellow kind of shape. It's got those big puckery sort of lips that he can use the same way as the smooth trunk fish. Uh, but uh, also a really cool thing, it's got those horns probably why they decided to call him a cowfish. Uh, and he's actually got a tank mate in here as well, if we could see him. He's called a goatfish, red goatfish. And I felt like putting the goat and the cow together made sense. It's like a little farm tank. All right, so why don't we feed this guy as well? All right, food is in. Now, as you can see, he's not necessarily as voracious as the smooth trunk fish, but uh, he's slowly making his way. All right, he's grabbing some food. Uh, how cool is this guy? Now, one interesting fact about the 
longhorn cowfish as a member of the boxfish family, it's nowhere near as toxic as the smooth trunkfish. You notice the smooth trunkfish were only living with other smooth trunkfish. Um, their toxin is so powerful, they can't live with any other fish in their tanks. Most aquariums will not house these animals because of how toxic they are. Uh, just not a smart idea if, if you have any other animals around. And one thing you might think is, well, if these are so dangerous, why do you guys have them? The reason why is these animals would not be alive without us. They couldn't survive without us. These guys are what we call a Gulf Stream orphan or a tropical stray. They only come up here in the warm parts of summer, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute here. All right, I think we're ready to go check out our next thing. So once you guys again follow me, we're gonna go find our next stuff. So the next animals that we're gonna be looking at here uh, it's actually the form that we find the smooth trunk fish initially when they come into Narragansett Bay. So they get washed into our bay through the Gulf Stream current as juveniles. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how that works in a minute here. But why don't we take a look here? We got a couple tanks here. Now these guys are really tiny. They don't always come out. So we're going to see if we can find any. We have them in two tanks here. Can you see one there, Jess? Yes, we can. Awesome. All right. So you can see a really young one there. I know it's hard to get some scale here, but that guy is maybe about a quarter of an inch to a half inch long. He's really teeny, teeny, tiny. Oh, and uh, here's the other one. Just found him. Oh, yeah, and this one is about half the size of that as well. Extremely small. So these guys are less than a year old. The ones that we first saw are closer to six or seven years old. Uh, much older, they've gotten larger, and as they age, that toxin just gets more and more potent. All right, wonderful. So I think we can feed, just because it's breakfast for everyone, I'm going to be squirting in food for these guys. You guys are lucky you get to join us today for, uh, for all the feeding. Let me give this guy a little food. Now, no guarantees that they're actually going to eat for us when we throw the food in. A lot of times these animals wait till we're not looking, and then they start to eat. Who knows? Maybe he'll be hungry, though, if you guys are lucky. Oh, he's looking at the food. Definitely looks interested. He's thinking about it, and he might not go for it, and that's totally okay, too, because we know that they'll always eat later. Excellent, make sure this guy gets a little too, and he'll probably eat it once we leave as well. But how adorable are these little guys? All right, excellent. So the next thing I wanna talk about is something that we've actually mentioned before. So why don't you guys follow me this way? So in previous Breakfast by the Bays, we've talked about something called a Gulf Stream Orphan or Tropical Stray. Um, and we've gone into a lot of depth with that. I want to just talk a little bit about some of the science that makes that happen. So what I mean by Gulf Stream Orphan is an animal that is getting taken from an area that's tropical and warm and getting washed up into Narragansett Bay via the Gulf Stream current. So if we take a look at our map here, um, the smooth trunkfish and the longhorn cowfish, their normal range is from the Carolinas, so about here, all the way down to the Bahamas, so kind of in this area as well, all right? Uh, and what happens in the warm parts of summer, uh, in the beginning of summer, uh, the adults in these areas will lay their eggs, tons and tons of eggs, and what'll happen is we have a very strong current called the Gulf Stream Current, kind of starts here from the Gulf of Mexico, down here in the Bahamas, and it actually washes those eggs up along our coast, disperses them, uh, and they go as far north usually as about Cape Cod, but tons of them end up in Rhode Island in Narragansett Bay because it's kind of shaped this way. It's kind of right there just catching stuff, kind of like a bucket uh, that gets washed up in our Gulf Stream current, all right? They have a great time here all summer. They do very well, but once winter comes, they don't survive. So what happens, the Gulf Stream, it's an interesting thing. What happens is near the equator, in the Tropic of Cancer, water gets really hot and warm. Now, warm water is actually less dense than cold water rises to the surface. Okay? And then when water makes its way up to the poles, it actually gets really, really cold. And cold water is much more dense than hot water, all right? It's more dense, and then it sinks down. And that creates a circular current, uh, and the water goes down, and then back up and washes all of that warm water up here, condenses, and then that cycle keeps happening, all right? Now, I love to talk about the science, but I really want to show you guys that this is something that's really happening. Let's go take a look, see if we can figure that out. Okay, here. So, I'm doing something a little risky today. I'm doing a science experiment that I've only done once before. We're going to see if we can make this work, okay? 
So right here, I just have some water. Uh, this water is just tap water. It's at room temperature. It's been, I took it out last night so it would come to the same temperature as the room. All right. And then what I have here, just a little plastic vial, all right? And some red food coloring, okay? So I'm gonna put, eh, you know, a few drops in here. One, two, three. Oops. And just about out, looks like I just made it for our experiment here. So we have a little bit of red food coloring in there. Now I'm gonna be working with some really hot water. So I'm actually gonna be safe. I'm gonna put on some gloves here so I don't burn myself, okay? Got some nice insulated gloves here. <clears throat> okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take our hot boiling water here. Not quite boiling anymore, but still very, very hot. I'm gonna pour some in here. Excellent. Okay, so you can see we have the red here. Make sure it's all mixed together, good. And that's gonna represent the warm water. It is, it is warm water, all right? So hopefully what we're gonna see is the warm water floating on top of the surface here, all right? Now what I have here is a bunch of ice cubes, all right? These ice cubes have blue food coloring. This is gonna be the cold water source for this. And if this experiment works, we're gonna watch the ice cubes melt, and as they melt, that cold blue water is gonna to sink towards the bottom um, of our little tiny ocean that we have here. All right, you guys ready? We're gonna give this a start. So the first thing I'm gonna do is put in a few of these blue ice cubes. And we're going to start to watch and see, as it melts, that cold, cold water will start to sink. Right. You can see it's really cold. Can you guys see it sink in there? A little bit. Yeah, it's going to slowly start. You can see some on the bottom there. Right. Yeah. You can see it right there, like a cloud. All right, and now I'm going to add the hot water towards the top here, all right? All right, so now let's watch this for a second. You can see the warm water is really staying towards the surface. And you can see the cold water is moving towards the bottom. And this is exactly what's happening in our ocean. This is that force, that property of water, how it becomes more dense or less dense, that's really driving the circulation of currents on our planet, moving that Gulf Stream around, bringing those tropical strays up here, those Gulf Stream orphans, and even controlling the climate on our planet. You could really see how the red is really sitting up there. That extra hot water, you can tell, is much less dense and just floating right on top of the surface there. And you can see how the bottom is turning nice and blue. Well, lucky me, the experiment actually worked for everyone. This is great. Woo woo. All right, awesome. So. Now that we know a little bit about how some of those uniquely adapted boxfish with their poisons have made it up here, we're actually going to now take a look at some other animals that have some interesting adaptations for defense. So before we move on, Janine brought up a really great point. Yeah. Um, she wants to know if we could put a piece of white paper behind it so maybe we could see, see this a little bit. better. Sure, yeah. All right, is that helping you at all, Janine? It looks great on camera. Yeah, you could definitely see the red on top there and how the rest is blue. Really interesting. And you can really see the blue just sinking straight down to the bottom there. You can see it's just running right down towards the bottom, that colder water. All right, excellent. Thanks, Janine. Hopefully that helped everyone a little bit. All right, so. If you guys are ready, let's take a look at another animal that has a really interesting adaptation. We're going to talk about some of his stories as well about uh, how he survives in Narragansett Bay. So you can take a look. He's right here in front of me. Now again, I'm going to switch to a separate pair of gloves because this guy is a preserved specimen here and he has chemicals on the outside of him that keeps him preserved. This guy's not alive. So this is a specimen that was donated to Save the Bay quite a long time ago and we use him to teach with now. Now, I don't know if anyone knows what this is, but this is one of my favorite animals. It's called a mantis shrimp, all right? Now, a mantis shrimp has just amazing defenses, so many different things we can talk about. This guy is like mind-blowing. It's from like another planet, it almost seems. It's so cool. So we're gonna talk about two things. We're gonna talk about its claws, and we're gonna talk about its eyes. So why don't we start with its claws, because we're right here. So if you take a look, right on the front here, he's got a really unique set of claws. 
all right? Now, Mantis Shrimp, there's two different kind of uh, defense types for Mantis Shrimp. Some of them have boxing gloves, and some of them have spears. This guy here, uh, in Narragansett Bay, the common Mantis Shrimp, the one that we get, they have these really sharp spears here. Uh, and it kind of looks like a mantis shrimp. That's probably how, or a, a praying mantis, the insect. That's probably how it got its name. Now these spears, uh, when it's being attacked by an animal, it allows to use those to defend itself and hit the animal, try and get them away. They're extremely powerful. They move almost lightning fast. You can't even see it when they strike. Just a really phenomenal animal. These guys live in burrows throughout Narragansett Bay uh, and just really amazing. A, a nickname for these guys is thumb splitters. That's what fishermen call them because if you accidentally pick one up, you're definitely gonna get a cut. Uh, these guys are just really phenomenal at defending themselves. Really, really cool. Okay, next thing I wanna talk about is its eyes, all right? They actually have really unique eyes. It's very hard to see on this specimen here, so we actually have a couple, you can even get kind of a good look here, but I have some printed out pictures right over here. Let's take a look at those. So if you take a look at this picture here, uh, we have some different eyes of the mantis shrimp. Now these eyes, they're, they're a little bit of a mystery to me, but let's talk about them for a second. So they actually have the most complex eyes of any animal on the planet. That's right, nothing has a more complex eye than these guys. We have one lens in our eyes. These guys have three lenses in their eyes, three lenses to help them see. Uh, and our vision, we can perceive three different colors, all right? We can perceive red, blue, and green color spectrum, and that makes up all the different colors that we see. Uh, these guys actually have 16 color recepting cones in their eyes that they can, and someone did the math out, some scientists that really knew what they were doing, they figured out mantis shrimp can see 10 times as many colors as we can, including ultraviolet light. So take a second, try and imagine a color you've never seen before. Does your brain hurt? Because my brain hurts. This, it's just a phenomenal thing. Uh, their vision's amazing, it's phenomenal, and no one knows exactly why they've adapted to have so many color recepting cones, the ability to see so many different colors. It's just a really crazy thing that these guys have going on. Uh, how amazing, maybe people can take some guesses. Why do you think that they can see so many colors? Who knows? Great question. All right, excellent. I think we're ready to see some other animals. I'm gonna take my gloves off here and sanitize just so I don't have any of those weird things on me from this. All right, guys, hope everyone is having a good morning today. I sure am. Uh, all right, let's head over to our next one here. Now this one is in kind of a dark corner of our aquarium, kind of hard to see, but we're gonna do our best over here. It's a really interesting animal. All right, and actually Jess, why don't you take a second watching them. I'm gonna go grab their food and be right back. So you can see these little juveniles here. They tend to like to hide in their cave, so a little dark right now, but there's one. Oh, Adam's coming in with the light so we can see them a little bit better. All right, guys, so you can see them, they're hiding here. This animal is called a short big eye. And let me tell you, these guys are phenomenal. Uh, they're just gorgeous. It looks like a really pretty goldfish. Um, but just like the smooth trunkfish longhorn cowfish, these guys are also Gulfstream orphans in Narragansett Bay. So some more rescues that we have here as well. And these guys have some really interesting defense adaptations. You might think, seeing an animal bright orange like this, how the heck is this gonna survive? He looks like a target. If you're trying to survive and you're bright orange, how are you gonna hide from predators? This guy looks like he would pick, be picked off in moments out in his uh, ecosystem. But let me tell you, these guys have amazing camouflage for the habitat that they like to live in. And let me see if I can try and describe that a little bit. All right, let's take a look at my poster here. <laughs> so, this, the short big eye here, when it's first born, it lives in tidal areas, in, in areas uh, right near the shoreline, okay? As it ages, it actually moves to deeper and deeper water, all right? So taking a look at my chart here, you can see uh, this side here shows depth. It goes from zero to 200 meters with 50 meter increments, all right? And then on top here, these are the various colors of visible light spectrum in open ocean, all right? So if we take a look at this, ultraviolet or purple spectrum goes down to about 50 meters of penetration. Blue is crazy, you can see blue really deep down, about 200 meters of penetration. 
green, you can see about 100 meters deep, and then the shortest length is actually going to be the red color spectrum. That actually is only going to go down to a little less than 50 meters of depth. So what that means, let's take a look back at our guy over here. Our short big eye is a bright orange, almost reddish kind of color. So what this means, whenever it's below those 50 meters of depth, it's practically invisible. You could barely even see this guy in the habitat that it lives in, uh, and, and the animals can't either, so it's invisible. They can't find him, and he's extremely well camouflaged. And he sits, he waits there, he's invisible, he waits for his food to come by, and then gulps it up. He has super reflective eyes, you can see those huge eyes to help it find its food, and a big old mouth. Uh, that'll open up and, and gulp down his food. All right, since we're here, keep watching this guy. I'm gonna grab some food and squirt it in. It's their breakfast time, like I said. We'll see if anyone comes out. And like I said, no promises. We're gonna put it in. You guys are here hanging with me. Figure you can help me do some of my chores. You know, me and Jess have been here uh, during everything that's going down, all the close downs, taking care of these animals, making sure that they're happy and healthy. All right, excellent. They're gonna get to that eventually, but if you guys are ready, why don't we head over to our next animals. All right, guys? We're gonna head over this way. We're gonna go into the Narragansett Bay at night room. Follow me. All right, guys, so upon first glance, this tank looks empty, but let me tell you, one of the most amazing interesting, weird creatures we have in the entire aquarium lives in this tank. Jess, let's see if you can get a close-up on where he is. All right, folks, can anybody see an animal hiding in the sand there? This guy here is called a northern stargazer. He's actually about a foot long, uh, and he's got a big old head and a long tail, giant mouth, all right? The reason they call him a stargazer is because you can actually see right over there, those two little dots, those are his eyes. He sits there, he can only look up to the stars, and he can't look anywhere else, and that's why they call him a stargazer. He has a big old mouth with sh big old sharp teeth, and when he's ready to eat, he'll actually create a negative vacuum, open his mouth really fast, and gulp up his food. But before he does that, he'll actually stun his prey. This is an animal that scientists call electrogenic. It can produce an electrical current to stun its prey, or even shock animals that are trying to harm it, uh, and hopefully get them to try and swim away. It's just an amazing guy. So let's take a look at my poster over here. I'm gonna try and describe that a little better. All right, so animals that are electrogenic uh, are bio have bioelectrogenesis. They are able to generate electrical current. The study of this is called electrophysiology. They're scientists that actually study specifically the electrical current moving through different forms of life. Uh, it could be anything as small as a slime mold, so teeny tiny bacteria. It could even be huge stuff uh, like a six foot long electric eel or our, our buddy here, the, the uh, northern stargazer. All right? So what we're talking about here is the generation of electricity by living organisms, kind of what we're saying there. Um, and it's done in different ways in all of the different organisms. I'm going to talk a little bit about how the northern stargazer produces that electrical current. All right? So this drawing here is the cross-section of a single cell in a northern stargazer, all right? You can see this is the cellular wall right here. This is what we call the extracellular space, so the space outside of the cell. This is the intracellular space. That's the space inside of the cell, all right? So the electrical current is actually produced in the enzymes on the surface of the cell membrane. All right, so right here, this is something we're gonna call a sodium potassium pump. What this does, it moves sodium and potassium, it moves sodium out of the cell body, out of the intracellular space into the extracellular space, and it moves potassium in to the intracellular space, and that helps move those different molecules in and out of the cell. Now normally, in most animals, this is a one in, one out kind of situation, but you can see for the stargazer, when it's ready to shock something, so it's about to be attacked, it needs to defend itself, it'll actually release three sodium ions and take in one potassium. What this does, it creates a voltage imbalance. 
And because of this imbalance, it produces that electrical shock, defending itself from various animals, stunning its prey before it can eat it. Um, and that's kind of how it works in this organism. And other animals have adapted other defenses to produce electrical current as well. All right, guys. Beautiful. We do actually have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's from Kim. She wants to know, uh, one of her students has a question. Yeah. It's about the last fish, which was the short big eye. Yeah. And he wants to know why he lives under a rock and how does it attack predators? Yeah, excellent. So the short big eye, when it's young and small, because the one that we were looking at was still a pretty young one, maybe a year old, something like that. When they're young and small, they live inshore. So they live closer to the low tide line, not in very deep water. So in order to camouflage, they really need to hide. So they'll find crevices, little caves, rocks, things like that. And it's going to wait for its food to come by and then basically ambush it. It's a type of ambush predator. So it has an extremely large mouth that will open up and then basically swallow things whole. Uh, and the reason why it has to swallow things whole, it can't bite little pieces, kind of like the trunk fish, uh, is because it's not moving, it's not active, it stays stationary, it has to wait for food to come to it. So it cannot afford to miss a single meal, it has to gulp everything up whole. Now as it ages and moves to deeper and deeper waters, uh, it's able to rely more upon becoming invisible uh, because it's beyond that color spectrum. And again, does the same kind of thing, just sort of waits really still and waits for its food to come by. Now it has those huge reflective eyes to gather all bits of light that are coming in from the ocean surface so it can see the food that's around them uh, and it has all these advantages to kind of help grab its food. Excellent question, Kim and Kim students. Very good. All right, wonderful. If there's not any other questions for today, I think we're all done here for today. As a reminder, we're doing our Breakfast by the Bays on uh, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 10 a.m. Uh, if you're from a school, leave a little note in the comments there. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, and if you enjoyed watching all of this and what we've been doing today, feel free to donate. There's a little link underneath there. Uh, otherwise, we'll see you again at the aquarium in the future, and I hope you all have a wonderful day and find some relaxation. All right, thanks.